church, I want to invite you to turn in chapter 6 of the book of Daniel. And I've got a lot of real estate to cover tonight, uh, almost 30 verses of scripture. Um, So I'm going to ask if you will remain seated, uh, but please uh, honor God's word with giving your attention to the reading of God's word. Um, This is a narrative, uh, so I feel it's appropriate to read the entire story or you won't know where we're going. Um, So beginning uh, chapter 6, verse 1 the book of Daniel. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. And no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that Whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king! Did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king. Or the injunction you have signed, but makes petition, makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, there is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then, at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, 
And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works and signs wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story. I know many of us are familiar with this story, even from childhood. But Lord, I just pray you be with us as we go through this text. I pray you will help it come to life. Lord, I pray we'll not only be amazed by this story, but God, we'll be amazed by you and what you do and what you're continuing to do even today. Lord, may you receive the glory from this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we think of Daniel, we usually think of lions. One of the commentaries I've been using for this study on the very cover of it is a picture of a lion. If you've been uh, following our YouTube channel, we were able to stream this Bible study. Uh, Jesse, our multimedia director, he put an image for this Bible study. What is that image? It is an image of a lion. This is because of the well-known story of Daniel and the lion's den. However, something I've been thinking about this week when it comes to Daniel, I think it's so fitting that Daniel is remembered with an image of a lion. I think it's so fitting that Daniel, uh, he wasn't put in a fiery furnace like his three friends, but his punishment came, he was put in the lion's den. I think it's so fitting that this happened to Daniel. Why is that? Because Daniel was a lion. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1 says, When the, the wicked flee, when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Daniel was just fitting in when he was put into that lion's den because he was bold as a lion. He was righteous, and because of his righteousness, he was bold. We've seen 70 years of the life of Daniel so far in the book of Daniel. Uh, this is the, the sixth chapter. This is the last narrative story. We're going to start seeing some, some things talking about the, the future times coming up in chapter 7. But we've seen 70 years of Daniel's life. He was righteous and bold as a young man. He was righteous and bold as an old man. If you're like me, maybe you've had a, a picture Bible or you've seen illustrations of Daniel in the lion's den. And for some reason, he's always depicted as a young man. But if you were paying attention to our story, Daniel was no spring chicken in this story. Daniel is an old man. He's in his 80s. He, he has lived life, and he has seen a lot. So I want you to remember that. He's in his mid-80s when the events of this story take place. So let's open, let's look at the text, and let's read more about this old man's story, shall we? The first thing we see about Daniel uh, in the lion's den is, number one, the promotion. The promotion. Daniel was appointed to be one of the three high officials who would govern over 120 satraps. Now these satraps, they were rulers of different providences. They, they were like governors of different areas. But Daniel, he was one of the three high officials that was to be over the, this 120. Now what was the purpose of that? Well, it was to govern them. It was to, to preserve the kingdom. 
But guess what a problem was even in that day? Fraud. Fraud. Corruption. Even the government then was corrupt. So Daniel was put in a position to make sure the king would not experience loss. And why would they put Daniel in a position like this? Because he was a man that could be trusted. This is the third time we see Daniel promoted in, in these six chapters, the book of Daniel. He was promoted in chapter 2 under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. He was promoted in chapter 5 under the rule of Belshazzar. And he is promoted under a new dynasty in chapter 6. This is the man that gets promoted. I mean, he would have made a great career in the military. Chapter 5 ends with Daniel being promoted, promised and promoted to be the third ruler of the kingdom by Belshazzar. Now, do y'all remember what took place in chapter 5? Uh, the handwriting on the wall, what happens to the kingdom of Babylon right after uh, Belshazzar uh, promotes Daniel. He makes him the third ruler of the kingdom. Well, as soon as that happens, the Persians come into town and take over. And you would think initially, well, that wasn't a great time to be promoted. I mean, yeah, he got promoted, but he was the, the third ruler of the, of the land for like five minutes. It's interesting, though. Chapter 5 ends with him being promoted to the third ruler of the land. A new kingdom comes in, a new government, a new system, all of those things. You would think Daniel would go back to the bottom of the totem pole. No. Chapter 5 ends with him being promoted. Chapter 6 begins with him being promoted. Uh, it, it's fitting. It's so ironic. He was promised to be number 3. What do we see happen in chapter 6, even under a new kingdom? He's one of the three high officials. Uh, many would see that him being a, a, a vice regent or president of the nation during his time. Even in his 80s, Daniel is still bringing it on. Even in his 80s, Daniel is serving with excellence. You would think this old salty dog would say, I've, I've done, I've I've, I've done all I can. I'm done. No, he is still bringing his A game. He is still serving with excellence. This isn't because he was an overachiever, but it's because he was a servant of God. Daniel didn't do these things for Babylon. He didn't do these things for Persia. He didn't do these things for Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't do it for Darius. He didn't do it for himself. He did all things unto God. He had the same spirit we see in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Something we need to remember. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. We see this attitude described more in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. If you were to go into our conference room next door uh, where our staff meets during the week, we've got some scriptures posted on the wall. Uh, uh, we have a few scriptures posted on the wall, and they all have to deal with the word excellence. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 is one of those verses. And why does our staff surround ourselves with, with verses like that? Because we want to be reminded that we are to serve with excellence. We want to be like Daniel. We want to have an excellent, extraordinary spirit within us. As we serve the Lord, we're to do it with excellence because he deserves the very best. But I know, I know some people get discouraged. They don't feel this way. I am a firm believer that excellence does not go unnoticed. Now, it might go unnoticed in this world. You might be like, man, I, I hustle and bustle, Pastor. I don't get the first lick of, of praise in my job. I mean, you need to come talk to my boss about that. But I, I'm just a firm believer. Even when man doesn't see it, God sees us when we give him excellence. God's word even declares this. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 14. The work of a man's hand comes back to him. 
If you work hard, it's going to come back to you. You might not see all the fruit now. You're going to see it one day. God's word declares it. Daniel always gave his very best. Like Joseph in the book of Genesis, he brought his A game every single time. Uh, there was a documentary about Michael Jordan that came out a, a few years ago. They were talking about after, I can't remember what year it was, it was in the middle of his career. He had just lost the, um, goodness gracious, the championship for NBA. What, what do you call it? Y'all help me out. Basketball people. The NBA championship. The finals. Okay? Uh, he had just lost that game. And usually after you lose that last game or the last game of the season, what do you do? You take a break. You take a break. And Michael Jordan's trainer said this when he said, hey, let's get back together in a few weeks. Start training. Michael Jordan told his trainer this. No, I want to get with you tomorrow. We're going to start training tomorrow. And Michael Jordan said this. If somebody's going to watch me play basketball, I don't, I don't watch basketball, by the way, so don't talk to me about March Madness and stuff like that. You can talk to Pastor Larry about that stuff, okay? All right. But he said, if somebody's going to come and watch me play basketball for an hour or two hours, I want them to have the best show on earth. I want them to have excellence. And we see that in athletes like Michael Jordan. But folks, we see that with great people in the Bible like Joseph and Daniel. And these guys, they, they didn't do it for their own self. They didn't do it for their glory. They didn't do it for their accolades. But they do it all for God. Something that we're going to see in the book of Daniel, this isn't a book where we're supposed to go home and say, oh, I guess I need to be more like Daniel. I need to be a Daniel. No, the whole point of this book is to give God glory. Daniel's life was all about God's glory. That's why he was always shining, because he was shining for the Lord. Verse 3 tells us the king did notice this excellence. What does it say? So he's already one of the three high officials. He, he's already been promoted. The king's eyeing him to get another promotion. It says the king planned to make him over the whole kingdom. He was going to be numero uno over this kingdom. So what does that mean for us? Be the best at whatever you do. We live in a culture, that, uh, it's sad, we, we live in a culture that doesn't value that anymore. But as a Christian, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, we are to do our very best in all we do. If you're a homemaker, guess what you're supposed to be? The best homemaker. If you're a teacher, be the best teacher. If you're a student, be the best student. If you're an electrician, be the best electrician. Not just to get the promotion, not just to get the pay, but to give God the glory. Think about it practically. If you're showing up on the job and you are just sorry, you have no witness. If you're just the lazy daisy that doesn't do anything, do you think anybody wants to hear you talk about Jesus? I, I wouldn't. I'd be like, no thanks, man. You're a loser. <laughs> We're supposed to give our very best because we serve the best. And when somebody looks at our performance, wherever we are, we should be able to say, man, I do this because of Jesus. I, every single day, I do for him. So if you've lost sight of that, if you, if you have just said status quo is good enough for me, government works good enough for me, please reassess life. Start living it for Jesus. Give your very best. It's gonna, you're not, I, I believe this. Your work's going to come back to you. But all the glory is going to go to God. Danny Aiken, the president of Southeastern Seminary, he points out this, though, about success. It comes with challenges. It can, he says this, it can get lonely at the top. Success can increase your enemies. The blessings of the righteous can stir up the jealousy of the wicked. All three of these prover proverbial sayings apply directly to Daniel. That leads to the next point of our story. We've seen, uh, we've seen the promotion. Number two, the plot. The plot. Look at verse four. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel 
with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. No error or fault was found in him. Man, what a way to describe somebody. No error, no fault, no grounds of complaint could be found against him. He was faithful. They couldn't find any dirt on Daniel. Nothing. He was a man of integrity. I'll never forget when I was in the Navy, my very first year in the Navy. My, my position in the Navy, I had to stand, I, I was involved with legal proceedings in the Navy. And when you get in trouble in the Navy, uh, you have to uh, stand on, on what's called captain's mass. And what that means is the captain, the CO, he is the judge. He's also the jury and the executioner. Uh, he, he gives the verdict. But I remember my job was standing there during this captain's mass because a young sailor had stolen. He got, he got caught stealing, which is very embarrassing if that happens to you in the military. Um, but in this captain's mass, there were, there were a few men there that had just been selected to be chief petty officers. And that's a big deal in the Navy. I tell you, if I would have stayed in the Navy, that was my goal, to be a chief. But chief petty officers, E7 in the Navy. And these guys were chief selects, and they had this whole initiation process. It actually takes place during this time of year. So it really just, this time of year just makes me think of seeing a bunch of chiefs being initiated. They have to carry around this weird little box. I still don't know the secret to that. Um, but I remember they were there for this captain's mass while this young sailor is standing, being punished. And the captain, he asked his chief selects. He said, chief selects, can someone define what integrity is and I'll never forget one of those guys he popped tall he stood at attention he loudly said sir integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking to this day I've never had to look up what the word integrity means that has just rung in my ears integrity is doing what is right even when no one is looking that defined Daniel Daniel did what was right in front of people. Folks, Daniel did what was right in secret when nobody was looking. He was faithful. Another way of saying that was he was trustworthy. He was honest, but he was also faithful and loyal to his position. It also communicates his consistency. Um, look at verse 5. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground or complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. They said, we can't find any dirt on this guy. He's so faithful. Let's use his faithfulness against him. So they couldn't bring a false accusation against him. So they said, we're going to bring something against him that we know that we can prove against him. That is his faithfulness. So they have to make this twisted plot, this twisted scheme to bring Daniel down. Look at verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, all of us have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. All of us have agreed, O king. Is that true? No. They're lying out of their teeth. In fact, all of us would exclude Daniel. They have lied. They, they've even said that Daniel agrees to this. Now, what do we know already about King Darius? Which, by the way, some believe that Darius and Cyrus are, are, are the same person. It is an obscure thing, to, but we're just going to call it King Darius because that's what the text says, okay? Well, what do we know about King Darius? What is his view of Daniel? He likes Daniel. He trusts Daniel. In fact, he thinks so highly of Daniel. He, he's made him one of the three high officials, but he's also said, man, I really like this guy. I think I could trust him with everything. He trusts Daniel. He loves Daniel. But here's the thing about King Darius. I don't know if he had his coffee that morning. 
he made a poor decision. He made a poor decision. Because in fact, I believe, this is what I believe about King Darius. I believe on a normal day, he would have asked Daniel, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? Daniel's no spring chicken, by the way. I mean, he's a, an older, accomplished man. And I think King Darius, it says a lot about his character to, to trust and value someone of Daniel's nature. I think on a normal day, he would have wanted Daniel's opinion. But he didn't think this through. He agreed with it. He fell for the bait. He went with the lie. Verse 8 through 9. Now, O king... Establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, the king Darius uh, signed the document and injunction. So I know this sounds crazy, but this was an actual thing for the, uh, the Medo-Persians. Uh, once something of this nature was signed, it was done. It was sealed. Uh, that's the way they did things. We see this elsewhere proven in the book of Esther, but it's also seen in secular, uh, secular writings as well, that the Medo-Persians really did follow this rule. That once a command, once an ordinance was made, it had to be followed. These folks were faithful. They, their word was their bond. But by agreeing to this, we already know King Darius is a little different than Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he, he's not puffy. He's not trying to get people to worship him. This isn't even his idea. He's doing fine just by himself. It took all of these people. It took his cabinet coming in. Just picture all these guys with suits if that was today saying, Oh, King, King, you really need to do this. You really need to do this. Just collectively, all these people telling him he needed to do this. So Darius, in agreeing to do this, he isn't trying to be a, a god. He isn't claiming deity. He's just being political. He's just trying to do what he thinks is best based on all the words of, of his advisors and his, all the people in his cabinet. It says this, by agreeing to this law, Darius probably did not claim deity, but rather adopted the role of a priestly mediator. His goal was to unite the Babylonian realm under the authority of the new Persian Empire. In other words, he's being political. He, he's wanting to bring everyone under the same page. But he hasn't really thought through the fine details of what he's just agreed with. Verse 10, we see after the law is signed that Daniel becomes aware of this. Why is that? Because it is a public decree by now. It has been blasted everywhere. I don't know how they did such things, but the heralds, everyone, they have declared what the king has signed. Daniel is aware. So what does Daniel do? When Daniel knew that the document had been signed... He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Daniel did not do these things out of protest. For some reason this made me think of our COVID days. God forbid those ever return. But what happened when COVID uh, took place? What did they try to say to the churches? Thou shall not gather. Now, some people, that was just music to their ears because they could just sleep in and not go to church. But for some of us that are just, just American, we don't like being told what to do. For some people that were probably nominal Christians at the time were like, we're going to church because they told us we couldn't. I believe it happened. I believe there's some folks. It, it, it might be somebody here. Hopefully you've repented. But Daniel doesn't do, he's not saying, oh, I'm going to pray because they told me I couldn't. Daniel's not doing that. Daniel's not praying out of protest. Look at the end of verse 10. Why is Daniel praying? As he had done previously. This man in his 80s was keeping his routine. He is doing what he has always done. He is being consistent. He is being Faithful. I also see him being a man in his 80s saying, I don't care what they have to say. I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing because that's what I'm supposed to do. He was faithful. He was doing what he had done previously. This wasn't his first rodeo with people trying to tell him he couldn't serve the Lord. He had resolve and conviction as a young man when they tried to change his diet. He had resolve and convictions when he was an older man. 
I heard a pastor today uh, preaching on the, the book of Daniel. A lot of times in life, I'm kind of in the middle right now, okay? A lot of times in life, we look back to our younger selves and we think, man, it was so hard to live for the Lord then. Raging hormones, peer pressure, temptation here and there. And it's as if we think, okay, it's going to get easier when I get older. But I've heard more and more testimonies of older folks saying it gets harder. It gets harder. It never goes away. I heard an old pastor, he was talking to J.D. Greer. He did mission work. I can't remember what country it was, but there was a red, a, le, a red light district, uh, which means nothing good happens there at dark. And the older pastor asked J.D. Greer, he said, be praying for me. And when we go on this mission trip, there's a, a red light district. There's a lot of temptation there. And this man was in his 80s. And J.D. Greer said, goodness gracious, you still got temptation in your 80s? And the older pastor said, I'm old, I'm not dead. <laughs> the temptations never go away. The struggle never ends. In fact, I think the devil, but how are we supposed to finish? Finish well, finish strong. The devil does not want to see that happen. He doesn't want people to finish well. He th he's probably, okay, oh, great, glad they got saved at that youth camp. I'll get back with them in a few years. He doesn't want to see people finish well. I, I think it's true. I think it does get harder. I, I think it gets harder the older we are. So there's a lot of truth in that statement. These folks, they thought they could bring Daniel down because of his faithfulness. They knew their plot would work. Because Daniel was so predictable. Do you know being predictable is a good thing? Because what does that mean? It means you are consistent. It means you're consistent. That's one of my biggest values in ministry is to be consistent. That's one of the reasons why when people get so crazy about Easter, I know this sounds horrible. Like, I don't like blowing Easter out of, out of proportion. I know it's a special day, but something I've shared with the staff is like, no, we're going to be who we are. We're not going to pretend to be something we're not. Because I don't want all, we had over 1,300 people here on Easter Sunday. You know what I wanted them to get a taste of? What every Sunday's like. Every Sunday should be done well. Not just Easter, not just Christmas Eve. Every Sunday should be done well. Every Sunday is a time that we celebrate the Lord and the resurrection, not just once a year. Consistency. Being predictable is one of the greatest virtues in this life. Daniel was predictable. He was consistent. He was so consistent that they actually, they built this plot because of his consistency. They're saying, hey, we can make this scheme, this, this, get the king to sign this rule saying, if somebody prays in the next 30 days to another God, they're going down. He's going to go down. He was that consistent. And think about this. They didn't have to wait a week. They didn't have to wait months. As soon as he signed this thing into order, verse 10 happens. They see it happen. He goes, they find him being so consistent because he's consistent. Here's a question. Are you consistent enough in your Christian life to where your opponents could catch you in your daily disciplines if you were in a similar plot like this? If, if they were to come and they were to say, man, oh man, let's, I got the perfect plan to get Malone Morris. Let's get this law signed into order. If we find him praying, if we find him reading his Bible, he's going down. But would the plan work out like that? Would they be able to come to your house that very day and find you? Or would they be like the detective sitting at the street saying, man, this thing's never going to happen. Would they have to wait days? Would they have to wait weeks? Would they have to wait for Easter? <laughs> Are you consistent enough in your walk with Jesus? Where if something like this were to be plotted against you, It'd be successful. 
this is such a commendation for Daniel. He's so consistent, he's so faithful that he gets caught praying because that's what he's always done. That's what he's always been faithful with. Daniel was so consistent in his prayer life that he didn't have to wait long to carry out their plan. Verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, should be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be provoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. He not only prays, he prays three times a day. He's so consistent. After this, we come to know that the king understands he's been a part of a horrible thing. He knows that what he's agreed to is not good. He understands the true intentions of these, these rulers that have come his way that they have plotted against Daniel. And the, point, the, opponents point, the opponents point out that the law cannot be undone. This was true for the, the Medes and Persians, as I've already mentioned. So what happens after this? This thing's fixed. The king can't undo it. What happens next? Well, we see the lion's den. Another word for den is pit. So number three, the pit. Look at verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. It's amazing that Daniel doesn't have to preach to the king. The king already knows about the God of Daniel. The king, he's already, he's already learned the things about God. And one, I think Daniel has been teaching him. If Daniel was such a right-hand man, he was talking about Yahweh to King Darius. But I also, I know this happened too. We don't know if the three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I don't know where they're at. I don't know if they've made it into their 80s. By the way, to live in your 80s in this time of history, you were ancient. Okay? So if you're in your 80s today, praise the Lord. All right? But we don't know if they're around. But think of all the things that have happened in the book of Daniel so far. When the Medo-Persians came into town, they had to hear about the things that have been going on in Babylon. They had to hear about this fiery furnace. They had to hear about this fourth man in the fire. They had to hear about the night when they came into town, some crazy hand came out of nowhere, started writing on a wall. They had to hear about all these dreams that have been interpreted and fulfilled by Daniel. This man knew all he needed to know about the God of Israel. And so what does he say? He doesn't say, Daniel, I hope you get out. I hope you can overtake those lions. He's not talking to flesh and blood. But he says, may your God deliver you, Daniel. May the God you've been telling me about do it in you. May the one I've heard the stories about deliver you. May I be a witness of what takes place. So, verse 18, it tells us that the stone was sealed over the pit. What does that sound like? A stone over a cave? This wasn't a cave, this was a pit, but where else do we see a stone rolled over something? The tomb of Jesus. And just like the tomb of Jesus, it was sealed. They sealed it. They didn't want it being tampered with. It had the king's signet. Y'all know about that with the little the ring pops they would wear with designs on them. Um, I used to love those things as a kid. They are disgusting nowadays. It um, looks kind of silly at a, a grown man eating a ring pop. I have four kids, okay? I get into their Easter candy. Um, but the king's signet ring, but then there were other signets sealing this thing, saying nobody can tamper with this. It's also kind of humorous. You've just put a man in a lion's pit and you're putting a stone over it thinking this 80-year-old man's going to get out? you thinking this guy's going to get out? I know I've heard of old man strength, but they're thinking he's going to get out. It's funny. 
is humorous. Verse 18. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Verse 18 reveals King Darius' true feelings for Daniel. He truly loved and respected this man. I mean, he really valued that. I mean, that says so much about Daniel, too. I'm an exile from another culture who has been in exile for 70 years. Now he's in a new kingdom, and he's still at the top. And this new king, we don't know how old he is, respects and admires this man. I don't think he's getting his feelings hurt that a, that a senior citizen is about to go into lion's den. I think he's upset because someone he truly loves and adores is about to be destroyed. And he's played a part in it because of his lapse of judgment. The king didn't sleep. He couldn't eat. It even says he fasted. King Darius' heart was, was troubled. And he was trying his best. During the day, he was trying his best to rescue Daniel. Now it's nighttime. He can't sleep a lick because he's so worried. He's so concerned. I'm going to say about his friend. Daniel. Look at verse 19. Then at the break of day, the king arose, went in haste to the den of lions, and he came near to the den where Daniel was, and he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? I'm just curious what the king was really expecting to hear. Coming to the pit. Coming to where this stone is. Oh goodness, the seal is still there. He's in there. I mean, was the king actually expecting to hear something? What, was he expecting to hear purring? Was he expecting to hear nothing? He says, oh Daniel! So what is he hearing? you got to think it's probably muffled because there's a stone over it. Oh king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. The text doesn't say this, but it appears Daniel had a wonderful night. It appears even he, he, he got more rest than the king did. He was doing better in a lion's den than the king was doing in his royal, luxurious bedroom. Daniel was doing fine. Just like his three friends decades earlier, an angel of the Lord came to rescue him. An angel of the Lord shut the lion's mouths. I think that's funny. They're, they're hungry. They're wanting Daniel, but the angel shut their mouths. The angel brought deliverance. Verse 23, then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Daniel, when he says he is blameless, that does not mean he is sinless. That does not mean he is perfect. Daniel was flesh and blood. There's only been one person ever to be sinless, and that was Jesus Christ. But Daniel is claiming that he was, his faith was in the Lord and that he was still faithful to the king. Notice this. Daniel did not save himself. Daniel's deliverance did not come from him. It came from his faith. Daniel couldn't do anything to save himself. God does all the saving through sending his angelic agent to come and deliver him from the lions. Verse 24, it, I know that's hard for us to read, but this is something that really took place during this time in history. We've even seen other accounts in the Old Testament. But the king commanded those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought in, cast into the den of lions. Not just them, their kiddos and their wives. He brought them all down. I mean, they had to, they pretty much, Daniel, he's the designated survivor. <laughs> because he just threw all the royal officials, the whole cabinet, into the lion's den. They're going to have to rebuild the government. <laughs> he's got a pretty good person right by his side to do that. But like Haman in the book of Esther, these folks died by their own schemes. 
their intentions to bring Daniel down were ultimately brought against them. And they were put in the pit. This verse also tells us this. If someone tries to say, I don't believe it. I think those lions were on, uh, they were tame. I think those lions like, were the ones for the circus. They didn't have any teeth. No, verse 24 refutes that idea. Let's read that together. The lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones in pieces before they reached the bottom. This lets us know, no, these weren't tame kitties. These weren't toothless kitties. They were vicious. The, the lion's den was the equivalent of a Roman cross. It was one of the most vicious ways to torture and kill a person. This wasn't by accident. God had delivered Daniel. We know these cats were doing their job because they took care of the, the foes. They took care of the opponents. While the climax of this story is Daniel's deliverance, really the climax is the bottom portion of chapter 6, verses 25 through 28. The story doesn't just end with Daniel being rescued. But the story ends with God receiving all the glory. So we've seen the promotion. We've seen the plot. We've seen the pit. Number four, the praise. Let's look at those verses together. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that my royal dominion people are to tremble in fear before Daniel? No, before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Folks, don't miss this. Many times when we read a passage of scripture, we like to look at the character. And we like to think, oh, they're the hero of the story. Daniel is the hero of this story. David and Goliath. David is the hero of this story. Remember this. There's only one hero in the Bible. It is God. He's the main character. He's the one you keep your eyes on. And folks... Daniel made it a point when he got out of that lion's den. It wasn't me. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. It was God. It was God. I know the king, he gives an excellent exposition of who God is. But an equivalent of, of this would be like saying this. King Darius is essentially saying this. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. This story ends... With a pagan king giving glory to God Almighty. The story's not about Daniel. It's not about a lion's den. It's not about a miracle. Those are parts of the story. And folks, this story does motivate me to want to be like a Daniel. I want to be consistent. I want to be excellent. I want to be faithful. But here's the biggest thing we should want. We should want to be servants of God. Everything we do is for him. Everything we do is for his glory. So I don't know where you are in life. I don't know if you're still working. I don't know if you're on the golf course. I don't know if you're in the classroom. I don't care where you are. Whatever you do should be for the glory of God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. I like this song we been hearing on the radio, it's been out for a couple years, by Casting Crowns. It says, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me. Only Jesus. I've only got one life to live. I'll let every second point to him. Only Jesus. Amen? Let's pray.